Is everybody dry? <laughs> Come on, it's the end of summer. It's hot. It's wonderful. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Luke chapter 15. Tonight, I want to talk about what it means to be faithful as we follow Jesus into the story that we are called to live into. We have talked about exile, and for some of us, that's a complicated term. What does he mean by that? What I mean by that is that as followers of Jesus, we are sent into the world to be his hands and his feet and his voice as the body of Christ. And, and, and as we engage this world around us that, that looks a lot like those upper bubbles, right? With all the different issues, with all the different polarization, we are tempted, I think, to say, you know, because I love Jesus, I'm just not gonna, I'm not gonna talk to those people. I'm not gonna hang out with those people. I'm not going to really engage the world. I'm going to pull back from the world. And I'm going to sort of just live in a world where people agree with me and I agree with them. And we deceive ourselves into saying that I'm doing that because I love Jesus. And the bottom line is if you love Jesus, then you love who Jesus loves. Right? Right? We cannot claim that our worship of God is so pure, is so rich, is so powerful that I don't have time for the mission of God, right? That's hypocrisy. And if we were honest, we would say, I'm scared or I don't want to be around people that are different than me. I don't want to engage that. And so we back up and we protect ourselves. And, and it's always fascinating to me when I became a believer because I became a believer at 18. And, and I came with no Christian background whatsoever. And so I walked into church and I told dirty jokes that I thought were kind of clean and probably appropriate. They weren't. Um, I remember... I cussed in church. I don't remember cussing. I just remember the pastor being like, please stop saying that. <laughs> and I was like, well, I don't even know what I said. But one of the things that I learned very quickly is that they were worried about my kind of, I just, I didn't fit in church. And if I stayed on this track, talking like I talked and acting like I acted, I might like bleed into some of these other people. We, I can look back and I can laugh, but I could also remember that there was such a great sense of fear in the church that I got saved in. I'm so grateful for those brothers and sisters, but the truth is they were afraid of the world and afraid that the world would somehow take something, take our rights, take our freedoms, and it's like they wanted to take Jesus and hide him in the basement so nobody could get to him and pollute him. But Jesus didn't protect himself. Jesus proclaimed himself. And it cost him his life. And so are we protecting Jesus? Are we thinking that we're protecting Jesus? Do we think we're protecting our way of being Christians and we're missing out on participating with Jesus in his mission. Tonight I want to talk to you about calling. What does it mean that we have been called by God into his story? And how do we live faithfully into that story knowing that there are a number of different stories that we are living among? That we are participating in as citizens of this world. How do we not get caught up in those stories and begin to believe that those stories are somehow the story and Jesus is just a subplot? And I really do believe it comes back to calling. 
Who has called you? What has he called you for? And how does that calling shape our life? And so I want us to look at Luke chapter 15. It's a familiar passage perhaps with many of you, but I want us to read through it. Follow along with me in verse 11. It says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and he set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. And so he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed the pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. That would be pretty severe. But no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And yet here I am starving to death. I will set out. I will go back to my father. I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And he was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father, he says to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. Amen. He was lost and he is found. So they began to celebrate. And meanwhile, the older son is in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard the music and the dancing. And so he called one of the servants and he asked to him, what's going on? And he said, your brother has come home. And your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and he refused to go in. So his father went out and he pleaded with him. But he answered to his father, look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. And yet you have never given me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He is, was lost and is found. When we gather together as men and we think about calling, calling comes from this word vocation, which means to to be called. And so we often think about like what we're called to do in work. And so when we gather in a room like this, the first thing we ask somebody is usually, what do you do, right? What do you do? Work is something that you and I are going to spend thousands upon thousands of hours of our life doing. And that has been true since before the fall, right? Before the fall. And, and I know we've heard this, this story before in the sense of salvation, and I believe it's definitely that's what this story is about But it's also about how we understand our calling and how that calling from the father affects our work. And so the younger son, what does he think of work? He thinks it's a bummer, right? He says, work is a curse and I don't want to do it anymore. And so what I want to do, dad, is I want to pretend that you were dead 
And if you were dead, I would get my inheritance. And so why don't we do that? He is. This thing doesn't work. <laughs> and so he sees work as a curse to be avoided. I have, uh, when I was, is this on? All right. When I was, whoa. when I was 18, uh, before I came to faith, I had 11 jobs in one year. And I, th I thought that was pretty impressive. <laughs> I, didn't have a, I didn't have trouble getting jobs. I just had trouble staying there. Because every time I started working, like I quickly got bored. And, or it was hard. And then I'd find another job that was like, oh, this job's going to be great. And I'd go get that job until about three weeks. And then I look for it. I remember when we did my taxes, my dad, we had a stack of W-2s. <laughs> and he was so like ashamed of that. And I was like, well, how many W-2s do you got? <laughs> you only have one. I got 11. Work is cursed. There's no question about it. We were put on this earth to work. We're going to work. God has given us a mandate to steward the word, world and to work for human flourishing. But after Genesis 3, work gets hard and work is cursed. And this young man, this younger son, wants to get past the work part and get to the payday part. So that he can go and do whatever he wants. I see this today with my own kids. There is a hope somewhere in a lot of 18 to 20 somethings that they are going to do something that goes viral and they will never work again, right? <laughs> Their Instagram is popping and it is worth a lot of money. And for every one of those, there are thousands of other ones that need to go to work. <laughs> so this younger son has this false identity of himself, this false reality of what work is and what it means. Work is a means to an end, and the end should be pleasure, and the pleasure should be for me. And so if there's any way that I can get rich quick and get to the pleasure part, I'm down. Even if it demands that I tell my father I wish he was dead. What is he truly called to? Are we called to pleasure? Are we called to independence? The reality is that work is going to be a grind, and some of you have been in the grind for year after year, but there is something to be learned in the grind of hard work, right? It is a purifying place in the grind. It has a, a, a way of causing us to ask questions about purpose and meaning and ultimately God and there is a redemptive place in the grind that leads to a, an awakening where you finally face it and you finally put your shoulder to it and you finally grow up and you have much to learn about God in ordinary day-to-day -day work. I got to Multnomah when I was nine months after I became a Christian and there I told dirty jokes to my professors that I thought were clean. And I, I didn't know they were dirty until I saw the look on their face. And I was like, oh, I wish I had that one back. <laughs> a few years ago, they hired me to teach at that seminary. And a couple of those older professors were a little appalled by that. They remembered my jokes. To the elder son, work is an idol. It's an idol that he uses to gain approval, to gain position, 
to prove his value. And so the elder son says, look, I have always worked. I'm a good worker. I'm a dependable worker. I'm a loyal guy. I'm hardworking. I am successful. I'm doing what's expected of me. But work for him was slaving away to get approval and to get attention. Work for him was about identity and position. And those two false understandings of calling that we work to get rich quick so that we can have the most toys or the most pleasure are part of the story that we're living in. But also work as identity, work as idol is another story that is found in the places that we live. It was about identity and position, and he uses his identity and position to exclude his brother. So when the brother comes back, he says, this son of yours, right? Not my brother, this son of yours. It's the way that we look at each other and we size one another up and we're like, what do you do? Well, here's what I do. It is proof of worth. It's proof of value. It's proof of belonging. I'm slaving away for the Father. It's another false self and a false reality and vision of what work is and what work means. And both ways are really built around fear and anxiety. And so for the younger son, it's that there's not enough. And so I need to make sure I earn more so that when I get enough, enough stuff, enough money, enough whatever it is, I'll finally be okay. I just need that one more thing. For the older son, it's that I'm not enough. But when I produce this, when I get that raise, when I get that promotion, then I'll be okay. But the father, he doesn't really play any of these games the father's calling is first of all not to work it's the calling to come home to the father's house and be celebrated over to be celebrated over both boys in the story are lost we know the younger one's lost because he goes out and he makes a mess of it he becomes a total wreck but I love that Jesus lets the parable end where we don't know if the older son comes home. The parable ends with the good boy lost. He's not in the father's house. But they're both invited home. And when we answer this first calling, and that is a calling not that you would look at meaning in life as something you can create through your job, or something you can gain by having it all, but that the deepest sense of meaning in your life will come when you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Father has celebrated over you and welcomed you home. I love the fact that he's practicing his speech, right? He comes up with a speech, I don't know if any of you had to go home and confess something to one of your parents, but the way that you practice that speech, I went to Chico State after I graduated because it was the number one party school in the country, and I thought, there's a, you know, a passion, a degree I can get. <laughs> and I sort of just partied and tanked out, and I remember coming home and having to face my dad, and the whole way home, I'm coming up with this great story uh, this great excuse, and I pulled into the driveway, and he looked at me, and he said, go, and I got back in my car and drove back to Chico. I was like, huh, I had a whole thing, right, that I was going to say, but you cut me off, and <laughs> but I love that he has this whole thing that he's going to say, Father, I'm not worthy. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm not worthy, but can you just hire me out? Can I be one of your workers? 
but he can't get the words out of his mouth before the father comes to him. Because while he was still a long way off, the father had been looking for him. And he humiliates himself by lifting up his tunic and running out to meet him. And the Leviticus law tells us if you have a son that has been um, rebellious, we know what you need to do. We need to stone him and kill him. And that needs to happen in public because I got a kid too. And he might start thinking crazy things. And Jesus flips the script and makes the father someone who is willing to embarrass himself to come out and embrace the son. The son. He can't get the words out of his mouth. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He doesn't even get to talk about the holy, but I'm going to let you hire me. He just simply, and the father says to him, servants, quick. And he gets a ring and a robe, and a kiss, and a party. I feel like in my time as as a pastor and being a follower of Jesus, I know a lot of men who have come to faith, who have believed, who have been forgiven from time to time, but they have never fully felt like they could come home. Because there's a sense of shame in the things that I did while I was in the far off land. That if anybody ever really knew, I I can come home, I'm okay, Father, if you just give me a job, like make me a pastor or something, I'll do that, I'll do whatever. But I don't, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I don't feel comfortable with this ring and this robe and this kiss. But that is the kind of father that you have. That is the story that you're in. The father invites you to come home to him. And you say, look, maybe I'm, I'm too bad to come home. I love that this parable flips that whole idea of good and bad on its head. He doesn't say, look, the older son's good And the younger son's bad. The older son wants to run off that narrative. But the father doesn't see bad or good. He just sees lost or found. Dead or alive. He sees that when he looks at you tonight. And he sees that as he looks to the culture around us. He says, Christ already has died to forgive sin. Now everybody can come home And he longs that his sons and daughters be found, not lost. And so he calls you tonight, calls each of us tonight to respond to the first calling. And our first calling before we do anything is to be celebrated over by the Father. Do you believe that of you? That the Father doesn't just love you, but he likes you, right? That he enjoys you, that he is pleased that you are his son. That he wants you to come home with him. And I know for many of you, you had a very similar experience with your dad that I maybe had with mine, where it's hard to believe that because I didn't think he really wanted me home. And I know for a fact there's times he didn't want me home. But my father is not the father, right? And the father God is the one that has the final say. And so our first calling is to come home and be celebrated over as a son. The second calling is that we would be about the father's business participating in his kingdom. The the father's house is not passive, right? There's work going on. The kingdom is breaking in. God is about his business. And there is a way of being his people that we are called to love and to serve and to work in the world that he's placed us. There's work to do. 
And whatever the work that we do that God has called us to put our hands to becomes a holy thing to God, sacred work. Wherever you are placed in this world, God has gifted you and he's called you and there's no mundane jobs or no unholy work for the most part. Wherever you have been placed in this world, you have a calling to live into such a way that that freedom of being a son of the Father would infiltrate the ordinary world that you inhabit. And that means that you have coworkers, that you have neighbors, that you have friends, that you are called not just to get the job done, not just to have a payday, but you are called as a son of God to represent your king and your father in the world. Which means that, that you don't look down upon those around you like the older son. But hopefully you'll see them through the lens of the father's heart that you would love to celebrate with the father when he throws Larry's party, because Larry's not home yet, but God put me in his life to help bring him home. We have a calling on our lives, and all of you have been put in some place of influence. Maybe it's one person, maybe it's two, maybe it's a, a whole crew of guys that you lead, but you have been called to be about the father's business just as Jesus is about the Father's business. And the third calling is holy work, right? The sacred participation with God in creating human flourishing in a broken world. You think about how we all got here. I know for, for when I was 18, work seemed mundane, Right? I don't want to do manual labor. I, I want to do something really important and really meaningful. And in fact, when I've interviewed certain pastors, I've had them say to me, I just could not work like a normal job, like a normal job with some really low, lame thing. I'm like, well, how did you get here today? Well, I drove. Oh, what'd you drive? A car. Huh. I wonder who made that car. Right, some boring, mundane thing. And let me see, what did you drive on? Oh, a road, the road, dirt, potholes, what? No, it was paved. Oh, cool. And what did the car run on? Gasoline, huh, how'd it get there? Right? You think about all of us gathered here today, right? All that went into just the fact that we could be here and we could eat 700 chickens and how many cows, right? And, and all of that has taken place because people, people that didn't even know it were participating in the flourishing of God's world. I mean, think about the guy that, that paints the stripes on the road. Seems mundane, right? Like drive, stripe, drive, stripe, Drive, stripe, drive, stripe. (laughs) But take those stripes away and see what happens, right? What would our freeways look like with no stripes? Just like, hey, everybody go for it. (laughs) You've maybe driven in some countries that didn't have the same quite road etiquette, per se, as we have. There is no mundane stuff. It's holy work and it's infused with holy identity. And God sends us, he calls us through a holy calling to participate with him in this work. So the work of your pastor, the work of the musicians, this is not more holy than your work. You all work with a congregation of people. You all work with people who are beloved of God, who need much grace, and all of them are called home to the Father. It may be a congregation of little kids. It may be a second grade class. It may be uh, guys that you are a contractor for. It may be 
an office, a business, whatever it is, you have been placed there to participate in something bigger than a paycheck, bigger than getting your name, climbing up the corporate ladder, because we all work for the Father and for his higher purpose. See, if, if followers of Jesus took this with them, if we understood that we were going to work not simply to get the grind over with, but we are going as beloved sons, called by the Father to participate in his kingdom mission, to do holy work amidst the congregation of co-workers that you have been called to. And somehow by his grace, your own experience of being the beloved son of the father might flow over into their life. And I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about when you light that employee up, then you go back and you ask forgiveness, right? I'm talking about demanding excellence but showing grace. I'm talking about a different kind of person that the ordinary world in these great stories that we're called to live in don't understand life this way. And we are living out of a rhythm where Jesus says, I'm going to change these very ordinary things like having people over to your home, like what you do with money, like how you rest and take time off and how you work. I want to infuse those with grace so that it won't be just Christians are the people who are huddling up over there to creating a new political party and hiding Jesus in the basement, but they are people who are living freely in a world for a much larger purpose, with great love and grace and freedom. Because our cultural stories do not create freedom. Working for money alone is not going to create freedom. Trying to get out of the grind is not going to create freedom. Making an idol out of work so that people are impressed with you is not going to create freedom. But what will create freedom is when you come home to the Father and you will realize that it is not what you've done right or wrong, but it's that he loves you and he has ran to you. And because what Jesus Christ has done on the cross Because of his death for sin, because through his own crucifixion, he is reconciling all things to himself. You and I are invited to come home and to receive his mercy and his grace. The truth is the prodigal son's story is not about you and me. It's really about Jesus. Because Jesus is the true prodigal son who left the father's house, who squandered his glorious life and his glorious deity on a bunch of sinful people like you and me. And he gave it all up to the point of death on a cross so that you and I could receive his welcome home. You and I are invited tonight to not just be saved, but to be the beloved, to experience the true grace, the true mercy, to come home to the Father, and when you thought you were going to get wrath, you got a kiss. When you thought you were going to get rejection, you got a ring. When you thought you were going to get chewed out, you got a robe and a party, because his grace is scandalous. And if it's scandalous enough to accept someone like me, then it's scandalous enough to save anybody in the world around us. So we are receivers of the Father's love, and we are the ones who are called to participate in displaying that love in the world. 
Brothers, tonight we have some friends that are going to be up here. And they would love to be able to pray with you as the worship team comes up and if the prayer team would come forward. You may be here tonight and you know what it's like to feel the prodigal son kind of fear and anxiety. And I want you to know, I want you to invite you that you would come home. These men will pray with you. These men will help you understand what it is to receive the ring and the robe and the kiss of the Father. And there may be far more of you who are like the older brother who is looking in from the outside at this party and you're a little worried about it. You're thinking that's too much grace. That's too much freedom. Why are they dancing? When you, your whole life in church, have slaved away and you've lived right and you've done the right things, but somewhere in your soul you still long to be celebrated over. Don't leave here tonight wondering if you're a lost brother in the backyard working or out in the world partying. Jesus invites all of us to come home to the Father. If you want to come home to the Father as we worship, and maybe you're even intimidated to come for prayer, uh, just ask some of the guys around you. They would love to come up and pray with you and pray for you. You don't need to come by yourself. But if anybody here tonight, we do not want you to leave here in shame and condemnation. We want you to leave here in the freedom of being found in the mercy and the love of Christ. Would you pray with me? Father God, we come to you today as sons, sons who have been lost in sin, sons who have been lost in idolatry and earning our approval. We come to you as sons who are broken and needy. And tonight, by your Holy Spirit, would we hear your call that you are waiting. And that you look at us and you don't see bad or good, but you see lost or found, dead or alive. So, Jesus, tonight, would you, by your spirit, prompt hearts in this room to move forward in prayer, to move forward to the Father so that he might meet us halfway down that road and bestow on us a ring and a robe and a kiss because we have trusted in you, Jesus the one who loved us enough to come and die in our place, to conquer our grave, to resurrect, and to give us your resurrection life. So Holy Spirit, would you move in this place? Would you have your way with us? And would you give us the courage to respond to the mercy and grace and salvation of Jesus? In whose name we pray. And they all said...